Today on the Bander Says Podcast, we'll be talking about what we can learn from Jay's two cents and his debacle and video on the SM7B, and a whole lot more, so go ahead and stick around. The SM7B is a complete waste of money and you should not buy it. Instead, you should put your money towards a blue Yeti, which you can EQ to sound exactly like the classic Shure SM7B. That is the general conclusion of Jay's Two Cents video talking about his audio setup and his experience with the SM7B. But before we dive any deeper into that topic, the first thing that I need to do is channel my inner YouTube commentary persona. Uh, like this Jay's Two Cents guy, I bet he doesn't give to charity at all. Did he donate to Australia or the coronavirus people? I mean, he's like so rich and I'm not jealous. I don't want any of that money at all. No, I'm just, I just hate him. I hate him so much. I'm not. <laughs> of course, I am not going to do that. That is a terrible, terrible, unfunny joke. I do want to address this though, and I will explain what happened. Jay's Two Cents is a YouTube channel that has maybe 2 million subscribers, I believe, maybe 2.5 million, and he put out a video talking about his audio setup and his journey to try to get the audio that he wanted. In that video, he explains that he bought the SM7B and it just doesn't give him the sound that he wants. He had to buy an external mixer, he had to buy a Cloudlift Uplifter, aka a Cloudlifter CL1, and he was unhappy with the sound, and it is an $800 waste of money. I, of course, will link his full video in the show notes if you want to watch the entire thing. And are you ready for a hot take? The SM7B was a complete and utter waste of money for him. Let me explain why. In this video, when Jay demonstrates the audio that he is getting out of his setup, he shows that he has the SM7B about a foot or maybe a foot and a half away from his mouth. He also compares it to a Blue Yeti, which is sat on his desk, maybe a foot, foot and a half away from his mouth. What that tells me about Jay is that the audio is not the most important aspect of what he is doing. What he wants is the microphone to be out of his peripheral vision. He does not want the microphone to impede his vision so he can see the screen in full view. Because of that, I agree with his conclusion that the SM7B was a waste of money for him because if you want a microphone to be a foot, foot and a half away from your mouth, the SM7B is probably the worst option on the market that you can buy because it is notoriously quiet and it just does not do well from a distance. So in order to make this a productive criticism of Jay's video and maybe help him out or help one of his viewers out who saw that video and was a little bit confused, I scoured the internet and I found this really old video documenting and explaining how to set the SM7B up properly. So I will go ahead and include that right here because even though it is a little bit basic, I think there is some really useful information in there on how to set it up and get the best sound out of it. This documentary is brought to you by the American Microphone Police. Option one, setting up your SM7B without a cloud lifter. Step number one, connect the SM7B to a microphone stand. Step number two, connect the female side of your XLR cable to the SM7B. Step number three, connect the male side of your XLR cable directly to your audio interface. Step number four, speak into the microphone and set your gain so you are hitting a healthy level. And the final step is to get the microphone close to your mouth to get the best sound. Option number two, using a FET head with your SM7B. Step one, connect your SM7B to your microphone stand. Step number two, insert the FET head into the XLR port of your microphone. Step number three, Connect the female portion of your XLR cable to the FET head. Step number four, connect the male side of your XLR cable to your audio interface. Step number five, turn on 48 volts phantom power. And step number six, speak into your microphone and set your gain so you are getting a healthy level. And the final step is to get the microphone close to your mouth prior to hitting record.
I don't know about you, but I can say with absolute certainty that I sleep better with the knowledge that the American microphone police are out there scouring the internet and scouring the streets and radio stations and home studios for microphone infractions and setting people straight. It makes me sleep so much better. But I refused to rely solely on the American microphone police, so I went ahead and recorded a few tests with the SM7B at different distances, as well as with and without the cloud lifter, or in my case, the FET head, to demonstrate what kind of benefit you can get from setting the SM7B up properly. So let's go ahead and jump back to that right now. Here is the first demonstration that I wanted to run. Currently, I'm about a foot, maybe a foot and a half away from the SM7B. I am connected directly to the 18i20, and my gain is set at 100%, and we're hitting around negative 24 to negative 18 dB. So simply put, this is way too quiet of a setup. Now, I am at the exact same distance, but I have put the FET head in line, turned on the 48 volts phantom power, and I have increased my gain to about two o'clock on the 18i20, and here is how it sounds about a foot and a half away from my mouth. Next up, I have removed the fed head from the signal chain, and I have turned off 48 volts phantom power, and increased my gain to 100% on the 18i20, and here is the hiss that you should be hearing. And the main difference here is instead of being one to one and a half feet away from the microphone, I am just a few inches from the end of it. You can tell you are getting a much healthier signal to noise ratio. You are also getting that more robust and warm low end. But here is how it sounds without a fed head in line. And lastly, I have now put the fed head in line again, turned on 48 volts phantom power, and I was able to decrease the gain on the 18i20 to about 12 o'clock, and here is the hiss you will get in this type of scenario. And with those quick demonstrations out of the way, you can tell that the addition or removal of the fed head or the cloud lift uplifter had a very minuscule effect on the overall sound quality, especially when we compare it to having the SM7B close to your mouth or a foot and a half away. So in summary, the moral of the story is instead of trashing a piece of gear for being an absolute waste of money based on setting it up incorrectly, learn the gear that you have, find out how to best set it up and get the best sound out of it, and then if you still dislike the sound, more power to you. Make all the bad videos you want about it. That's your opinion, and that's your prerogative. But trashing a piece of gear because you aren't getting the sound that you want out of it because you unfortunately set it up incorrectly seems a bit disingenuous, or at the very least, a bit misleading. So with all of that being said, what can we learn or what can we take away from Jay's two cents and his experience with the SM7B and trying to get the audio that he wanted? I think the main two takeaways are we need to research before buying and learn before upgrading. What I mean by that is before buying something, you should do proper research to determine if the item you're purchasing is going to fit your use case and your needs. Alluding back to what I had said earlier, it was clear to me that Jay wanted his microphone setup to be 12 or more inches away from his mouth. If that is the case, if that is something that Jay is dead set on, then he should have researched the SM7B, realized what a low output it is, and realized how poorly it performs from a great distance, and determined, this microphone is not right for me. So either I need to find a different microphone to fit my needs, or I need to adjust my criteria, or adjust what I am okay with in my setup to get the sound that I want. And the reason that I am bringing up a second takeaway as learn before upgrading is Jay's Two Cents has been talking about just buying the Go XLR, which is an additional $500 purchase, assuming that would fix the issue. The reason I think that will not fix the issue is because the main issue with Jay's setup is the fact that the SM7B is so far away from his mouth, and the easiest solution would be to move the microphone closer to your mouth. So instead of throwing $500 more at an issue, at a problem that he already thinks is $800 wasted, stop for a second, 
take a breath, do a little bit of research, learn the gear that you have, and see if you are able to get the sound that you want out of the gear that you currently have. Do not think that just constantly throwing money at an issue is going to solve it, because if the issue is you don't know how to use the gear that you have, or you are not setting it up properly, throwing money at it is not going to fix it. Learning the gear that you have is going to fix it. And I am fairly certain that I will get some kind of comment saying, But Bandrew, you're an SM7B fanboy shill! That's why you're making this video! <laughs> Go ahead and say that, I don't care. You can say that about me all day. Yes, I am an SM7B fanboy, but that is not my issue. Do you want to know why? This is a mindset that I have on so many things. The microphone that you choose to use has zero impact on me. I couldn't care less if you choose to use a Neewer lav mic. Doesn't matter to me. The real reason that I'm making this response to Jay and his video is I think it's a little bit odd to criticize a microphone, specifically a broadcast dynamic microphone with an insanely low output for not performing well as essentially a boom microphone. That would be the same as buying a lavalier microphone and saying, this is a waste of money because it doesn't allow me to record that audio 20,000 feet away. This lav mic is a waste of money because it doesn't do good at background noise rejection because it's omnidirectional. What a waste of money. That's why I am making it because I feel like there needs to be some kind of correction here and I wanted to offer Jay some different insight or a different perspective to his take on the SM7B. And to be clear, I don't think that Jay's two cents is a bad guy, and I don't think that he was intentionally trying to mislead people or try to push a different product. I don't think that's the case at all. I just think that Jay made a mistake, and everyone makes mistakes. Everybody should be allowed to make mistakes. It is so easy to do, and everybody will do it. We cannot and we should not hold Jay to this super high standard where he can never make a mistake or he's the worst person ever. No, I've made mistakes, you have made mistakes, Jay has made mistakes. And that is why I tried not to criticize Jay himself, because I don't think that's productive at all. I don't think that would get the information across. And speaking from personal experience, when someone attacks you, or maybe not attacks, but gets very aggressive towards you and name calls you, the last thing you want to do is listen to that person now. So I am trying to convey the information in a tolerable manner, in a civil manner, and say, hey Jay, I disagree with you. If you do want your microphone set up a foot, foot and a half away from you, I do agree. The SM7B an absolute waste of money. I will disagree with you on one thing though. I don't think you can EQ the Blue Yeti to sound like the SM7B. And in closing on this topic, I want to reiterate the point that if you come across bad information on the internet, I think the worst course of action that you can take is to get overly aggressive towards that person who put out the bad information, maybe give them the benefit of the doubt. I highly doubt that anybody is risking their entire reputation to put out misinformation intentionally. People make mistakes. We need to remember that. We need to be willing to forgive them and attempt to educate them, provide them with useful information in a civil manner. So if you come across information that is incorrect or just bad in general, put out good information. That is the best course of action in my opinion. There you go. That is it for the news. Now there is a bunch of other stuff that we are going to talk about. First up, what have I been testing? You have been listening to it this entire time. I have been speaking into the Manly Reference Cardioid Condenser Microphone. This is a tube microphone which is greatly revered by many, many people. I do really like it, but it is jarring for me to jump to this because this has one of the crispest top ends that I have ever come across on a microphone. I am sure that you have heard that in this show. It is very, very bright, and unfortunately, I have an issue with my microphone. I think it might actually be busted where it is way, way, way too noisy. It almost sounds like there's a bit of wool rubbing over the diaphragm of the microphone. It has these little pops and cracks. So I have a surface 
a surface, a service ticket submitted to Manly to see if we can get that resolved. And then I will review it and do all of that in 10 years when I'm finally done testing it and getting my money's worth. So that is what I have been testing. Let me know what you think of it in the comments or send me an email or send in a voice submission. You can send that to askbandrew.com. There is instructions there and you can send all of this stuff. You think about it. Let's jump to what you had to say. First comment comes from Sound Speeds. Sound Speeds! And he says, Bandrew, you are spot on about a larger room being better than a smaller room due to reflections. It holds true in treated rooms as well. This is why NPR went from very small treated rooms to big treated rooms, less claustrophobic sounding and feeling. One thing I'd add is that every time you double your distance from a noise source, the volume decreases by 6 dB, and in an untreated space, that's why you hear less reverb in a big untreated room. First time listener, great show. Alan, thank you very much for sending that in and clarifying or confirming my suspicions about why bigger rooms are better, as well as adding the additional context of as you double your distance from a sound source, it will decrease by 6 dB. So maybe instead of setting our studios or our microphones up against a wall, we should set them up in the middle of the room and that would lead to us being the farthest away from the walls as we could possibly be and the reverb would be as low as possible. Something to think about, don't think I'm gonna do it, but hey, that's something good to know. Thank you very much for that, Alan. I appreciate and Sound speeds! All right, next comment comes from Stefan, and they say, Are maybe tools like Honey a reason for the reduction of affiliate percentage from Amazon? They also take a cut from every deal. Stefan, I think this is a very interesting theory that I had not considered prior to you leaving this comment. So affiliate marketing, to my understanding, is intended to reward people for driving sales and driving traffic to a specific site. Honey, if I'm not mistaken, as you alluded to in your comment, earns their money from inputting their affiliate codes every time you make a purchase on a website that has an affiliate marketing program. But at the same time, Honey is not actually driving traffic to these sites. They are not driving traffic, they are not driving sales. Honey is just acting as a browser-based middleman on your purchases and adding their affiliate code. I think that could be a big issue with Amazon and every other affiliate program. Let me give you a few examples. I am person X and I am in desperate need of a pair of socks. I don't know anything about socks. I don't have a favorite pair or a favorite brand of socks. So I jump on YouTube and I type best socks review. And I find out from a really well-produced video that podcastage socks are the best on the market. And this YouTube reviewer has an affiliate link in the description. And I know that that person will get a cut of that sale if I click that link. So I click that link to reward that person for providing me that information. And Amazon is rewarding them with that payment for driving a sale to their site. A second example is... I am person X. I already know what my favorite sock brand is. It is podcastage socks. So I jump over to Amazon. I buy the socks and the only people making money from that are Amazon and the company podcastage socks. The last example I have is where you install honey on your browser. I am person X again. I already know that my favorite sock brand is podcastage socks. I have Honey installed on my browser, I go to Amazon, I go find podcastage socks and I place them in my cart and I place that order. In there somewhere, Honey, I believe, places their affiliate code in there so they get a cut of that sale. So now, even though Honey did not contribute to my decision to buy podcastage socks, they are getting a cut of that sale. So Amazon sales are not being boosted at all because Honey exists. Honey just found a clever way to get in between Amazon and you and add their affiliate code to get money from every purchase you make. If I am not mistaken, I could be completely wrong, but that's my understanding of how Honey works. That would put a very bad taste in Amazon's mouth because they are losing a crap load of money for a company not doing anything to contribute to increasing their sales. 
that could be a very big reason why Amazon said, you know what, we're going to cut the affiliate percentages because we got to stop giving honey so much damn money because they are doing nothing. I like your theory, Stefan. Appreciate you. That one made me think. I liked it a lot. Next comment comes from Jeffrey, and he says, Having affiliate links to unethical companies in your video description only serves to make your review questionable in the first place. It actually says a lot about the content creator one way or another. Not judging, just saying. Jeffrey, thank you very much for that comment, and... I don't know if we're going to get to any kind of conclusion on this topic because ethics are so incredibly subjective. I may find Amazon to be ethical, somebody else may not. I may find Apple to be unethical, other people may find them to be ethical. There is no absolute in ethics. It is so incredibly subjective, so it is difficult to say this person put an unethical affiliate link in their description. My approach to linking to anything or promoting anything or making a video on anything and recommending it, I will not promote or drive traffic to any service or product that I myself would not use. That means I am not going to promote any of these VPN companies. It also means I am not going to promote Raid Shadow Legends, even though I could be making money doing both of those. I choose not to do that because I think those services seem a little bit shady, so I am not going to promote those and earn money off of that. But on the other hand, I use Amazon and Sweetwater almost on a daily basis. I use them way more than I probably should, and I am comfortable using those platforms and promoting those platforms because I have always had good experiences with them. Therefore, I am willing to use the affiliate programs and essentially promote both of those companies because I have had good experiences with them I do not see any huge unethical behavior from all of them. We could get into ethical debates. I don't want to do that here. If you want to go into a DM, go ahead and send me a DM. <laughs> we can argue about ethics all day long and we'll never find common ground in most cases, but it could be interesting. So that's my take on it. I personally use Amazon and Sweetwater. I trust them with my information. I trust them with my purchases and with my dollars. And that is why I am comfortable using the affiliate programs for both of those companies. That's my stance on it. That's it. That's it. That's my Trump. <laughs> Next comment comes from Zubair. They say, thanks. Loving your podcasts. I agree with the eldest bro about social media distancing. I already have an anonymous account for Twitter for a specific topic where I do not want to be known and I have more or less abandoned it in the last few weeks. I hardly use my normal Twitter anyways. Facebook was already at a minimum for me. I think it's better to learn new skills and experience other things. What I have found value in during having extra time is starting new projects which I do see through. And at the moment, it's podcasts. Watching you on this podcast was useful. I see how absolutely 99% of the time you touch nothing to avoid noise pickup, i.e. mouse across the desk. Between you and Booth Junkie, you have set me on another path. Thanks. Zubayer, thank you for that comment, and I think you are doing the absolute right thing if you have extra time using it in a productive manner because it is easy to fall down a dark path of just checking social media and saying, oh my god, the end is nigh, the end is nigh. But I am very happy that you noticed my approach to addressing peripherals while recording. I used to use my Logitech MX Master, and when I would scroll, you would hear me doing this and just tapping on the desk, and it was obnoxious and I hated it. So I switched to a trackpad and I used that to just scroll through my outline and make as little noise as possible. I also don't type while I am recording and I don't sit here and bump the desk while I am recording. It took me years to get to that point, but I have eventually learned how to do it and it has become second nature to not make noise by bumping crap while I record. So that made my heart warm. My heart soared with the eagle's nest from reading that comment. Thank you very much, Zubair. Best of luck on the podcast and best of luck with learning new skills during these trying times with the extra time that you have. Next comment and last comment comes from Music Gear Network. He says, loved this video, buddy. Several takeaways. One, I just tried the timestamps and I don't have the chapter markers as of yet. Two, 
bummer on Amazon affiliates as we were making some side coin with that. However, as you say, diversify, and we do that with multiple resources, merch, Patreon, and others. Three, your AC just turned on? We've, we live in Canada and we had snow yesterday. You suck! Number four, <laughs> I shared your Lady Gaga post with the legend John Cunaberti today, and he said two things. A, this is why God created engineers, and B, looks like the maid set up her mic. Keep up the awesome work, my friend. Eric, thank you very much for that comment. It is very comforting to know that I am not the only one disgusted or disturbed by Lady Gaga's inability to set up a microphone properly. <laughs> I am especially comforted knowing that a legend such as John Cubierte, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that he shares a similar outlook on this issue. Also, if anybody listening is interested in guitar, you need to check out Eric's channel, Music Gear Network. It is incredible. He is a monster guitar player, and he does amazing interviews. He just at, had on Orianthi, I believe. Really great stuff over there. So if you're into music or guitar, go check that out. And Eric, thank you for the comment. Now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. Alrighty, welcome to the ABS. The ABS, I feel like that is some, <laughs> some kind of disease. If you have any questions, you can go to askbandrew.com. There are instructions on how to send in an email, send in a video, or send in a voice submission. And I appreciate the voice and video so I don't have to read. Go check that out, askbandrew.com. First comment, or first email rather, comes from Ian J. They say, hello, Bandrew. I was wondering if you had noticed the price inflation of many, if not all, Behringer audio interfaces over the course of the past year. Things like the UM2 have went from $30 to $50, but nobody seems to have noticed and still refer to it as the $30 audio interface for beginners. This inflation has been going on for over a year, so it's not because of the pandemic, and I was just wondering what your thoughts are on said inflation. Ian Jay, thank you very much for that question, and I don't think that this inflation or increase in pricing is exclusive to Behringer. I have seen it across many, many devices. The first thing that I noticed it on was universal audio interfaces and preamps. Mainly the preamps, I saw them go from 1600 to 1800 and then the UA Solo went from 1000 to 1100 So I saw that maybe a year and a half ago. It's nothing new. It's not because of the pandemic. What I believe has led to it is tariffs on China. And the reasoning behind those tariffs is trying to motivate companies to bring their production back to a certain country. Unfortunately, that has not happened yet. And because of that, we are still seeing these increased prices. It's probably because some of the production, some of the manufacturing can only be done where it's currently being done. It's being done there because that's where the factories are and that's where the expertise is. And on top of that, even if the manufacturing did come back to, for example, the United States, I don't know if we would see a decrease in prices because labor in the States is significantly more expensive than it is in China. So I don't know if we will ever see a decrease in the cost of some of these electronic pieces of equipment, some of the audio gear. I think it is just natural increase in pricing, which sucks, but it's the way things go. Great, great question, though. ENJ, I appreciate you. Next, we have a email from Sonny. He says, hey, Bandrew, have you seen or played with a new NVIDIA program for noise removal? It is still in beta, but I listened to a clip on a web article when someone had Cherry MX Browns typing behind a blue snowball. It was pretty noticeable, obviously. Once the noise removal program was started, the noise from the keys was pretty well gone. I'd be interested to know what you think about its performance and the effect it has on your mic's audio. Thanks. Sonny, I have not played around with this software because I do not have a Windows PC with the necessary graphics card to get this feature and be able to test it. I have watched a few demos of it, and yes, it is very, very impressive. The thing that I think sets this apart from other noise removal plugins or programs like 
Crisp, which is being beta tested on Discord, which sounds terrible, by the way. But what sets it apart from stuff like Crisp is it doesn't seem to be affecting your voice the entire time you're recording. That is where the AI aspect comes in. The AI aspect. I highly doubt it's actual artificial intelligence. But the algorithm that they're using seems to say we don't hear excessive background noise or noise in these frequencies or of these characteristics. Let's not take anything out. So when there is not background noise, your voice still sounds normal, even if you have the noise removal turned on to a significant amount. But once you start to have background noise, then it does start to affect the tone of your voice, much like any other noise removal plugin would. And it seems to perform the best when you have a consistent background noise, like a fan, a computer fan, or some kind of other fan. If you have inconsistent background noise, like a helicopter flying by or maybe dogs barking outside, I think it would affect the tone of your voice quite a bit more compared to a consistent background noise that it can learn and then remove. So that is my take on it. I think that if they were able to package this as a standalone box that you can plug into a Windows or a Mac PC, I think they would make a killing selling it to broadcasters and podcasters and ENG folks who were out on the streets talking to people and don't want all that background noise. Pretty cool progression, pretty cool development. And I look forward to seeing how this improves over the coming years because they are doing something really, really cool there. Thank you very much for the email. Next, we have a voice submission. So go ahead and take it away. Hi, Ben Drew. Um, what are the best and most comfortable headphones for listening to talking under $150? I am a language teacher and being able to properly hear what my students say is very important. I would like to wear headphones for long periods of, of time without any listening fatigue or physical discomfort, e.g. around the ear or the top of the head. And also, this is a bit less important. I would like them to be fairly good at at least passive noise cancelling or rejection so that I can hear whatever a person says when my neighbors are drilling or there is a lot of outside noise. I am currently deciding between the uh, Sennheiser H HD 280 Pro and the Audio-Technica um, M40 axis and M50 axis. Um, but I'm open to other suggestions as well. Which ones should I pick? Thank you very much for that question. What a great question. And I will admit, I am no headphone expert. I have not tested all of the headphones under $150. Of the headphones that I have tested in that budget, the most comfortable that I have come across would be the Philips SHP 9500S's. These are open back headphones. So if you want to block out external noise, not going to be the best for that. But I have worn these for hours on end, and I would forget that they were on. That's how comfortable they are. They have very little clamping force. So if you move around a lot, they will fly right off your head. But if you remain relatively stationary, they are extremely comfortable, and you don't really have to worry about them flying off your head the sound is quite a bit brighter than a lot of other headphones, so if you are sensitive to higher frequencies, not going to be your cup of tea. As far as closed back headphones, that seems to be more difficult because there are a lot more of them, and I have not tested them all, and I personally love the 7506s, but I know people hate them because they think it makes their ears too hot, or it does make their ears too hot. Other people swear by the ATH M50Xs from Audio-Technica. They think they are the most comfortable. I don't agree. I find the 7506s to be more comfortable for me. So with these smaller ear cups of these closed backs, it's much more difficult to recommend a comfortable pair compared to the, what are these? The SHP 9500Xs because these ear cups are flipping massive. These will fit anybody's ears, and they breathe like a son of a gun, so your ears won't get hot. But if you want to block out outside noise, and you are concerned about bleeding from the headphones into your microphone, 
The SHP 9500S's may not be the best choice, but that would be my recommendation. I hope that helps. The second voice submission we got, I am not actually going to play. Normally, I would play it, but it was essentially just a thank you message, and I wanted to let that person know that I appreciate the kind words very much, but I don't know if everybody listening would get any value out of it, so I am just saying thank you to you right now. Thank you very much. You are very kind, and I appreciate it. Lastly, we have another voice submission, so let's go ahead and jump to that right now. Hey, Bandrew, Brian Wellen calling. I'm just following up with regards to the recent email I sent you. I managed to score a Samsung Q2U USB microphone. Got the last one in my state or province since I am up in Canada. But I still have uh, the original question, uh, which uh, over time would be the best option for audio quality and versatility is to stick with the USB port or get myself an audio interface. Uh, any insights you have on this would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. What an amazing question. Does the Q2U benefit from being plugged into an audio interface or does the USB output of the Q2U suffice? Is there any difference? What do I do in these situations? I record a test to demonstrate it. So here is a test of me speaking into the Q2U, recording the XLR and USB simultaneously, and cutting back and forth between them so you can hear if there is any difference, and I level matched them both to negative 16 LUF, so there should be no level discrepancy there. So let me know what you think in the comments down below, and I hope this helps you in your decision on whether to, whether to use the Q2U as USB or to upgrade and buy a USB audio interface. For this test, I am concurrently recording the Q2U over USB as well as over XLR into the 18i20. On the 18i20, my gain is set at about 4 o'clock, so almost at 100%. But here is how it sounds, and I will switch back and forth between XLR and USB so you're able to hear the difference and see if you think the difference is justifiable when everything is compressed and put out in a podcast format or a YouTube format. And that actually wraps up the Ask Bandrew segment and everything else as well. We are at the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming by this week. Thank you so much for listening or watching and engaging and sending in your voice submissions. Again, if you want to send in your voice, go to askbandrew.com and send that in. Save yourself the pain of having to listen to me read. <laughs> I don't I don't request the audio and video for my benefit. I request it for your benefit <laughs> so you can get a break from my voice and my inability to read because I'm a preschooler. I have the mind of a preschooler. Uh, goo goo ga goo poo poo poo. What? What am I doing? I'm losing my damn mind here in quarantine. Okay. That really is it. Thank you so much for coming by. <laughs> God. I really am losing my damn mind. I love you all. I hope you have an amazing Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then next Sunday I'll talk at you. <laughs> Stay safe. Wash your hand. Avoid people. Oh, wash your hand as though you have one. It wasn't me. It was the one-armed man. How are we still in the outro? I don't know. I love you. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.